Member for Niagara Centre. I'm sorry, Niagara West. Pardon me. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity today to uh, give you some of my thoughts on this budget. Uh, you know, I really believe this budget is, is a lot of baffle gab and bluster. I believe it's short of substance and it saddles future generations of Canadians with massive debt. And I think that's one of the, the, the biggest uh, challenges I think we have in this is that we're going to be putting the burden on our young people, on our kids and our kids' kids uh, to pay off this uh, massive debt that we're going to incur over the next few years. The Prime Minister campaigned on the promise to run a modest $10 billion deficit, but it wasn't long after the election that he broke his promise. He pledged to return to a balanced budget, and he's been, that pledge has been completely abandoned. And to top things off, our national debt is spiraling out of control. Now, before I continue, I think I would just want to mention to you, Mr. Speaker, that I'll be sharing my time with the uh, member from Lethbridge, if I could do that. Uh, this budget is simply, I believe, nickel and dime in the middle class. It's making the cost of living more expensive for middle class Canadian families. And it's becoming obvious uh, to us here in this place and to Canadians across the country that the Liberal economic plan isn't working. Budget 2016 failed to create the jobs and failed to grow our economy, and Budget 2017 is just more of the same. The Financial Post reports that in 2016 the economy had one of the most difficult years with growth at merely 1.3 per cent growth. It also goes on to say that looking forward, it doesn't get much better and that the federal government's own Department of Finance predicts economic growth will average just 1.6 per cent outlook uh, towards uh, 2030. The further report notes that growth expectations for private sector economists have consistently declined since the Liberal government came into power. Even more troubling is that the Liberal economic update forecasts have consistently decreased and now have been downgraded to 1.6 in the budget 2017. Our party leader correctly noted that the government's own numbers show that the economy is growing no faster than before the spending binge began. She also correctly noted that Canadians are working fewer hours and their wages aren't keeping up with the cost of living. The Prime Minister shouldn't be surprised by all this. He can't expect different results by using the same old Liberal tax and spend methods. As was the case in the 2016 budget, this year the Liberals have once again abandoned small business. And the small businesses are the largest employers of Canadians across this country. Mr. Speaker, almost every business needs a tax break. But when it comes to spirits, wine and beer, the Liberals have decided to increase their taxes by 2%. This tax hike would have a negative impact on wineries, craft breweries and small distilleries in the riding of Niagara West. And consumers will once again have to pay more at the cash register because of more Liberal taxes. I've received numerous letters from stakeholders in the wine industry who are pleading with the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance to reconsider this ill-conceived tax hike. Wine is amongst the highest value-added agricultural product in Ontario, and many of our grape growers may face economic hardship on the face of this tax increase. Wine is one of the Ontario signature industries, should be supported and promoted by a federal government, not selectively targeted. The long-term impacts on wineries across Canada will be immense, and so will the impact on others in the value chain, including restaurant workers, bartenders, delivery truck drivers, and others. Mr. Speaker, for the sake of the long-term survival of the Canadian wine industry, the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister should pay attention and consider immediately reversing this tax hike. The wine industry is not the only victim of the Liberal overtax, and here are some of the others who will feel the pit Liberal pinch as well. Pub public transit users, for example, Roughly 1.8 million Canadians will see higher taxes and higher prices for bus passes because they have decided to get rid of the public transit tax credit. A Toronto Transit Commission anal analyst showed that elimination of this credit will mean 2.5 million fewer people who will ride the TTC in 2017. Uber and ride-sharing services will become more expensive because the Liberals have decided to slap a tax on them. Others included will be donated medicines, childcare, Small business owners, including farmers, fishers, doctors, lawyers, accountants, oil and gas companies, and the tourism industry. These are all in addition to Liberal tax hikes last year on gas and home heating, higher taxes on Canadian savings accounts, implementing more payroll taxes for businesses, and ending tax breaks for children's soccer and piano lessons. It seems like no matter what the Liberals do, they always somehow end up raising taxes on the average Canadians and plunging our country into more debt and deficit. 
It also seems strange that the Liberals are calling their budget 2017 their innovation budget. There's really nothing new or innovative in this budget. Many of the programs are recycled and repackaged. What's becoming clear is that they have no plan, no commitment, and no ideas on how to create jobs and to grow our economy. But here's the kicker. They're spending billions on buzzwords and catchphrases. Unless you're a venture capital catalyst or a super cluster, this budget is simply not for you. Innovation thrives when businesses and entrepreneurs are free from excess of taxes, regulation, and interference. But this budget takes the opposite approach. It picks the winners, and it doesn't really care about anybody else. Here's what really worries me. The Prime Minister promised to run modest deficits for a couple of years. And so what this is turned into will be him borrowing over $103 billion over six years. If that's modest, then I don't want to see or want to hear what he considers to be large deficits. What Canadians must keep in mind is that our national credit card the Prime Minister keeps swiping works very similar to their own credit cards. Namely, the money needs to be paid back and paid back with interest. Incredible amounts of money have already been borrowed. What this means is that not only this generation, but generations to come will need to pay the principal with interest on the debt being racked up now. As a Canadian turning 18 today won't see a balanced budget until they're in their 50s. Essentially, our children and even our grandchildren will be on the hook for paying off the debt that the Prime Minister is needlessly racking up now. This in addition to making every, all Canadians pay more for taxes for virtually everything. But this explains only half of this vicious cycle the Prime Minister has been inflicting upon us. What happens when the debt can't be paid back? Will he raise taxes more? And round and round will go again. With all the spending of billions of dollars on our national credit card, the Prime Minister couldn't seem to find sufficient money, uh, amount of money for a men and women in uniform. For the second year in a row, the budget contains very little for them. Budget 2017 makes major cuts to defence, despite demands from the U.S. and our NATO memberships, spending that we spend or commit to spending at least 2% of our GDP. The government is deferring the $8.5 billion in equipment purchases, and they have already deferred $3.7 billion in the past budget. The Department of National Defence now faces a $12 billion shortfall. It certainly doesn't look like national defence is a priority for this Liberal government. In an era of so much Liberal spending, it is very concerning that the largest cuts are consistently at the expense of the Canadian Armed Forces. This begs the question as of whether or not the Liberals believe that Canada needs the ability to defend itself against our allies from clear threats like Russia, North Korea, Iran and ISIS. Recent examples include the Liberals' decision to pull out our CF-18 to the fight against ISIS, their preference for fourth-generation fighter jets, their lack of increased support for our Ukrainian allies and their failure to advance important procurement projects, all suggest that the Prime Minister is of the view that other countries should be relied upon to do the heavy lifting. With growing United States pressure for increased budgets, Canada's allies have committed to modernizing their military capability and spending 2 percent of their GDP on defence. Our Prime Minister has not followed suit, putting us in a very precarious position. Considering the global, clear global threats to our security, we need the appropriate investments in Canada's national defence, and we need them now. But the Finance Minister doesn't seem to agree stating that the government believes the military is appropriately provisioned. Mr. Speaker, we are living in dangerous times where our security as a nation should be regarded with the utmost importance. Why not allocating the necessary funds to our armed forces? We're playing a dangerous game and putting our country at risk. It is simple. The Liberals are asking Canada's military to do more with less, and this cannot stand. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the aisle, we will continue to fight for resources that our Canadian armed forces deserve. If the Liberals won't listen to us here in this place, then I hope they'll listen to us, to the hard-working Canadians that this budget is directly affected. According to a Nanos poll report in the Globe and Mail, most Canadians are giving the Liberals' government's uh, second budget a thumbs down. What this poll found is that Canadians are expressing a strong desire for the Liberals to lay out a plan for eliminating the deficit after the budget, but made no mention of where the federal books will be balanced. It's no surprise that only 5 per cent of Canadians had a positive view of the budget. Nick Nanos himself said, and I quote, I think the fact that only one out of 20 Canadians had an outright positive view of this federal budget should give the Liberals pause because it suggests that the budget, at least for a number of Canadians, was a disappointment, end quote. 
Mr. Speaker, when Canadians were asked if it's important to them that the federal budget has a, pl a plan in place to eliminate the deficit, four and five Canadians agreed that this plan should be in place. The reality is the Liberals have no plan. We as the official opposition and as Conservatives are the voice of the taxpayers and will hold the Liberals to account. We will not we cannot stay silent when the Prime Minister nickel and dimes Canadians with no plan whatsoever to create jobs or grow our economy. Too much is at stake, and we hope he listens and understands so far that his ideas are not working. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker.